Have you ever wondered what your dreams mean? Join us in Dream School at thisjungianlife.com and find out. Jung wrote, Dreams are a little hidden door in the innermost and most secret recesses of the soul. Dream School is a unique, self-paced online program you can start at any time that unlocks access to your inner world. Our 12-month program provides the support, knowledge, and guidance you need to reach within, decipher your personal dream code, and harness it to optimize your life. By enrolling, you'll join an affirming community of fellow travelers, each pursuing a unique quest. And it's fun. Join us on an adventure to wholeness and healing through understanding your dreams. Go to thisjungianlife.com and click on Dream School. You'll be taken to our secure checkout. Once you join, you'll get immediate access to our first three modules. You can get started right away. We look forward to seeing you there. Welcome to this Jungian life. Three good friends and Jungian analysts, Lisa Marciano, Deborah Stewart, and Joseph Lee, invite you to join them for an intimate and honest conversation that brings a psychological perspective to important issues of the day. I'm Lisa Marciano, and I'm a Jungian analyst in Philadelphia. I'm Joseph Lee, and I'm a Jungian analyst in Virginia Beach, Virginia. I'm Deborah Stewart, a Jungian analyst in Cape Cod. Hello, everybody. Um, Joseph and I will be with you today. Uh, Lisa is on vacation, and Joseph and I will take it away. Today, uh, we are going to apply a Jungian lens to a biblical story for our time, uh, the famous story of Jonah and the whale. But before we go into that, let me sort of widen the lens um, as to what we're doing and provide a frame for it. The Bible, of course, is widely recognized as one of the world's sacred texts. So what is a sacred text? Well, a sacred text is a source of revelation, wisdom, wisdom particularly about the divine. Uh, Sacred texts offer us lessons for daily life, for values, for how to organize our human instincts and drives how to establish them, and what the supraordinate norms are or, or ought to be. So that kind of veers like a Venn diagram that overlaps uh, sacred with myth. And depending on your own uh, religious background, what is myth to you may be sacred text for someone else and vice versa. So mythologies have all kinds of significances. They offer us cosmologies Uh, We can look at them from an anthropological point of view, a cultural point of view, to some extent a historical point of view, sociological, metaphysical, and, of course, psychological. And what Jung says about this is that we must read the Bible or we shall not understand psychology. And then he offers one other thought that is very important to what we're going to do today, the essential context of all mythologies and all religions and all isms is archetypal. So we'll take a look at that and at the psychological significance of of Jonah, uh, because if we are to understand ourselves and this time that we're in, we need a psychological view. Uh, so that we can really make meaning of what these things offer us. So the story of Jonah, the Bible, it's not only a psychological text, and we certainly are not reducing it to that, but it is also psychological. And how we can recognize its truth. So with that big wide frame of uh, daring to encompass 
uh, such a huge work. Um, let us narrow it down to our friend Jonah for today. Let's enter the story of Jonah as if it were a reverie or a dream. I'm going to read the entire book of Jonah, so let's settle in and relax and let the images act upon our psyches so we can talk about the universal impact of this theme. The word of the Lord came to Jonah, son of Amittai, go to the great city of Nineveh and preach against it, because its wickedness has come up before me. But Jonah ran away from the Lord and headed for Tarshish. He went down to Joppa, where he found a ship bound for that port. After paying the fare, he went aboard and sailed for Tarshish to flee from the Lord. Then the Lord sent a great wind on the sea, and such a violent storm arose that the ship threatened to break up. All the sailors were afraid, and each cried out to his own god, and they threw the cargo into the sea to lighten the ship. But Jonah had gone below deck, where he lay down and fell into a deep sleep. The captain went to him and said, How can you sleep? Get up and call on your god. Maybe he will take notice of us, so we will not perish. Then the sailors said to each other, Come, let us cast lots to find out who is responsible for this calamity. They cast lots, and the lot fell on Jonah. So they asked him, Tell us, who is responsible for making all this trouble for us? What kind of work do you do? Where do you come from, and what is your country? From what people are you? He answered, I am a Hebrew, and I worship the Lord, the God of heaven, who made the sea and the dry land. This terrified them, and they asked, What have you done? They knew he was running away from the Lord, because he had already told them so. The sea was getting rougher and rougher, so they asked him, What should we do to you to make the sea calm down for us? Pick me up and throw me into the sea, he replied and it will become calm. I know that it is my fault that this great storm has come upon you. Instead, the men did their best to row back to land, but they could not, for the sea grew even wilder than before. Then they cried out to the Lord, Please, Lord, do not let us die for taking this man's life. Do not hold us accountable for killing an innocent man, for you, Lord, have done as you pleased. Then they took Jonah and threw him overboard, and the raging sea grew calm. At this the men greatly feared the Lord, and they offered a sacrifice to the Lord and made vows to him. Now the Lord provided a huge fish to swallow Jonah, and Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. From inside the fish Jonah prayed to the Lord God. He said, in my distress, I called to the Lord, and he answered me. From the deep in the realm of the dead, I called for help, and you listened to my cry. You hurled me into the depths, into the very heart of the seas, and the currents swirled about me. All your waves and breakers swept over me. I said, I have been banished from your sight, yet I will look again toward your holy temple. The engulfing waters threatened me. The deep surrounded me, seaweed has wrapped around my head, to the roots of the mountains I sank down, the earth beneath barred me in forever. But you, Lord my God, brought my life up from the pit. When my life was ebbing away, I remembered you, Lord, and my prayer rose to you, to your holy temple. Those who cling to worthless idols turn away from God's love for them. But I, with shouts of grateful praise, will sacrifice to you. What I have vowed, I will make good. I will say salvation comes from the Lord. And the Lord commanded the fish, and it vomited Jonah onto dry land. Then the word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time. Go to the great city of Nineveh and proclaim it, 
the message I give you. Jonah obeyed the word of the Lord and went to Nineveh. Now Nineveh was a very large city. It took three days to go through it. Jonah began by going a day's journey into the city, proclaiming, Forty more days, and Nineveh will be overthrown. The Ninevites believed God. A fast was proclaimed, and all of them, from the greatest to the least, put on sackcloth. When Jonah's warning reached the king of Nineveh, he rose from his throne, took off his royal robes, covered himself with sackcloth, and sat down in the dust. This is the proclamation he issued in Nineveh. By the decree of the king and his nobles, do not let people or animals, herds or flocks taste anything. Do not let them eat or drink. But let people and animals be covered with sackcloth. Let everyone call urgently on God. Let them give up their evil ways and their violence. Who knows? God may yet relent and with compassion turn his fierce anger so that we will not perish. When God saw what they did and how they turned from their evil ways, he relented and did not bring on them the destruction he had threatened. But to Jonah, this seemed very wrong, and he became angry. He prayed to the Lord, Isn't this what I said, Lord, when I was still at home? That is what I tried to forestall by fleeing to Tarshish. I knew that you are a gracious and compassionate God, slow to anger and abounding in love, a God who relents from sending calamity. Now, Lord, take away my life, for it is better for me to die than to live. But the Lord replied, Is it right for you to be angry? Jonah had gone out and sat down at a place east of the city. There he made himself a shelter, sat in its shade, and waited to see what would happen to the city. Then the Lord God provided a leafy plant and made it grow up over Jonah to give shade for his head to ease his discomfort, but Jonah was very happy about the plant. But at dawn the next day God provided a worm which chewed the plant so it withered. When the sun rose, God provided a scorching east wind, and the sun blazed on Jonah's head so that he grew faint. He wanted to die and said, It would be better for me to die than to live. But God said to Jonah, Is it right for you to be angry about the plant? It is, he said, and I'm so angry I wish I were dead. But the Lord said, You have been concerned about this plant though you did not tend it or make it grow. It sprang up overnight and died overnight. And should I not have concern for the great city of Nineveh, in which there are more than a hundred and twenty thousand people who cannot tell their right hand from their left, and also many animals? So, Deb, as you said, the Bible can be seen as a collective myth, a collective dream. Mm -hmm. Of course, it can be taken as a religious revelation. But today, using our work as Jungian analysts, we're going to think about this story of Jonah as if it were a dream that an individual had, perhaps even a dream that some guy named Jonah had. <laughs> And then he woke up, perhaps greatly relieved, and that he hadn't actually lived that out, but had been changed, perhaps, in some fashion. Since this is a fairly long dream, uh, why don't we wend our way through it and just sort of take it from the top? This dream begins with the situation, the psychic situation, as it is. Jonah doesn't want to go to Nineveh. So right at the outset, we have a conflict between the ego and what we would refer to as the voice of the self, of a greater calling, go over there to this city of iniquity and wickedness and uh, tell them to stop it. The dream ego, Jonah, says, in effect, hell no, I won't go. And off he goes to Tarshish. 
you know, maybe he's going to go on vacation instead of mm -hmm. escape to um, the equivalent of a Caribbean island. <laughs> and there's something just in that opening vignette that is so universal to all of us. Mm. That higher part of our personality, the fuller part of our personality, has a kind of natural ethical attitude that our waking personality is not always aligned with. So there's a message from the larger part of Jonah's psyche that he needs to go into an aspect of his own psyche where these instinctive, problematic, quote-unquote, evil influences and behavior, which we would call the shadow, are rummaging around, huh. causing a kind of internal conflict. And the self is, at the start, said, you need to become awake. You need to become conscious of this internal terrain. And like many of us, Jonas says, hell no, I won't go. I don't want to hear that. Don't confront me. I don't want to know about these problematic parts of my own personality. And we all know that shadow is all of that that makes us intensely uncomfortable. We reject it. That is absolutely not me. And there we have Nineveh. Those are horrible people. I don't like them. And I'm not going anywhere near my shadow. And also how we project our shadow. That when we don't want to know something about ourselves and we see it in other people, we can attack them, but also we can find them so negative, so upsetting that we flee and run away and don't actually have a human engagement, which might force us to have to reassess whether or not the people we're projecting this on actually deserve the degree of criticism and hostility that we were sure they deserved a short bit ago. So Jonah does two things that we know are ubiquitous amongst us when we are confronted with shadow. The first thing is, is that he denies it. Uh, I, I'm not going, I'm, forget it, that's not a job for me. And the second thing is that he has projected uh, some of his own failings, his very own shadow qualities, onto the people of Nineveh. It's them, not me. And then he decides to go down to Joppa, which is a port, and decides he's going to take a cruise instead. <laughs> <laughs> he goes somewhere else for the holidays. And uh, the self has decided that that's not going to fly. And this tumult begins to churn that is so intense that it creates both this fear of mortal death, but also it evokes this kind of suicidal despair in Jonah. Because he says several times, just let me die. Just strike me dead. Throw me in the ocean. There's something really depressive and despairing about Jonah, really right from the beginning. One of the uh, dream figures uh, in this dream that is one of my favorites is the captain, a shadow figure for Jonah's better self, because Jonah goes down into the hold of the ship and goes to sleep. And the captain, this shadow figure, goes down there and he says, what are you doing? Get up, call on your God. Uh, we have a problem up here. <laughs> Captain's like an analyst. <laughs> wake up, wake up. Wait, wake up, come up on deck and help us deal with this. So no more evading and avoiding for our dream ego, Jonah. So we can imagine that Jonah's kind of regressed. That as he's fleeing the self and going on a cruise... He does fall asleep. He falls into this childish place where he's just assuming the captain and the crew are just going to take care of everything. And he's just kind of, kind of nap. And just as you said, the captain is an incredibly important figure because he calls Jonah to consciousness, you know, wake up. And the sailors uh, reiterate this, this call to consciousness. 
Um, and I love this language. Um, it's just so contemporary. They say to Jonah, tell us, why has this calamity come upon us? What's your occupation? Where do you come from? What's your country? What people are you from? That there is going to be some causal relationship here between the storm and, as it turns out, of course, Jonah, because he says, I'm a Hebrew. And the sailors really take this in, and, they, and, the, and it says they know that he's fleeing from the presence of the Lord because he had told them so. So they see into uh, Jonah's higher calling, symbolized by being a Hebrew. So I, I'm, I'm still back on these questions that the sailors ask him, which reminds <laughs> me a little bit of like a psychoanalytic intake form. <laughs> like, how how long have you had this problem <laughs> that's right what kind of work do you do uh where, what's your address uh where do you people come from uh, what's your personal history what's uh, your ancestral <laughs> history that even there there is at least this instinct that that his history that his that his complexes and life experiences are all or could all give a clue as to what tumultuous force has been released in his psyche, what's causing the calamity. And, and that's something that, uh, by the way, is particularly Freudian. I mean, that was part of Freud's insights that you're in the midst of a calamity. You start asking questions and you also start asking questions very similar to what the sailors ask. How are you living and what's your history? And that's the beginning of the inquiry around the calamity that any of us might find ourselves in. And as you had said, Deb, he comes forward and says what defines him, that he's a Hebrew and that he worships Adonai, that he worships the God of Abraham. Now, that doesn't really give them much uh, relief. <laughs> so he says that, and then in, in that book of Jonah, this terrified them. That's an interesting thing for us to midrash on. Like, why would that information be so terrifying? The implication, I think, is that uh, Jonah identifying himself as worshiping this particular God is recognized by other aspects of the psyche represented by the sailors as superior, as a very special kind of calling. They recognize that, that Jonah is responsible because he has failed to live up to principles that he nevertheless espouses. Don't we all uh, <laughs> find ourselves in this situation? But the turning point here is that now Jonah takes responsibility. Uh, the sailors confront him, and Jonah says, pick me up and throw me into the sea, and the sea will quiet down for you, because I know it's because of me that this great storm has come upon you. And isn't that exactly what we would want an analysis to do? Mm -hmm. It's to say that, you know, I have a problem, let's say I have I have a father complex and it's making me, putting me in constant calamity with every work boss I've ever had. And when that individual finally says, throw me into the issue, throw me into the calamity, I'm not going to avoid it anymore. I'm going to put my hands on the tumultuous problem of my life and I'm going to stop running away. And, and that is an extreme extraordinary shift of attitude, as you said, Deb, there's still a process that's going on, but that's the first kind of transformation that Jonah's gone through, that he wakes up and he wakes up on several levels, including, as you said, that he has some responsibility around what's happening. That he has recognized, he has taken back uh, any projections that he might have had you know, you offered the example of the workplace and the bosses that are always problematic. And he's taken back that kind of projection that it's me. 
This problem resides in me, which I think is one of the wonderful things about doing psychotherapeutic work. Is people come in knowing uh, that they are like Jonah in this situation, that some of this is me, at least some of it. The storm that I call my life uh, involves me. And I'm the I central have, character. <laughs> I'm the central character. I have played a role. The other thing that uh, I love is the next uh, phrase is that the sailors are resistant. <laughs> yeah. Um, I mean, that part of the psyche, which I can imagine is perhaps the sensate function, it's very earthy, it's the laborers on the ship. You know, that part of the psyche is really hesitant. They're not really sure that they want to just jump into the calamity. They start rowing wildly to try to reach land. Uh, they're trying to do anything they can to not have to jump into the calamity. And they don't want to murder Jonah. They're really afraid that, uh, you know, they're going to uh, be guilty of doing something wrong. And I think many of us, if we go back to this idea of jumping into the calamity of our life, do question whether or not we can survive that. Mm -hmm. You know, I just can't do fill in the blank because it'll just destroy me in some fashion. Exactly. Something is going to die. And the sailors, part of the psyche, say, oh my gosh, you know, is this really what we should do? Is this really okay? But they do throw him overboard. In order to save the rest of the psyche, they make this sacrifice, and that is what they call it. They offered a sacrifice to the Lord and made vows. But, as it turns out, we all know already, Jonah doesn't die. The Lord provided a large fish to swallow up Jonah, and there he was for three days and three nights. And I can't resist this. But when I was a child uh, going to this very nice congregational church, there was a book that had an illustration of this poor little man sitting hunched over a tiny little flame of some kind of little cook stove in, in this great big dark belly of the whale. <laughs> and there he was, all wet and so on. But he had some sort of... Uh, of a little fire to keep him warm in the belly of the whale. <laughs> and so this part of the psyche doesn't die. Instead, it's swallowed up by something greater. And what could that be? And that's always the question is, when we cast ourselves into the thing that we are most avoiding, the shadow, that there is a kind of grace that can come to us, that can envelop us. He's still in the tumultuous ocean. He's still powerless in this situation, but some living thing has encased him and made it possible for him to survive in this environment. And not only, but the great fish is a denizen of the tumultuous ocean. It's like an emissary of the ocean. Now, this could mean a lot of things. It could be a symbol of the anima, that often when the ego is absolutely devastated by the power of the unconscious, the anima or the animus can come forward and mediate the relationship between the ego and the collective unconscious, which is totally overwhelming, and create a kind of container, some kind of safety that the ego couldn't actually generate itself, the ego would probably become psychotic, which is a kind of death. And uh, Jonah has a real encounter here where the dream ego in this dream has to surrender to the self, has to surrender to something greater. And, and Jonah says, as my life was ebbing away, I remembered you and my prayer came to you. 
in this darkness, the three days and three nights, uh, which is so archetypal, the moon is dark for three days and three nights. On Good Friday, it was three days and three nights before the resurrection. Mm -hmm. uh, so this is it's mythic and archetypal. There is a surrender of the ego to something greater. And it's a repetition of birth imagery. I mean, to return to the belly is to return to the womb. And so as Jonah is cast into the great waters, the waters of the great mother, the waters of the unconscious, he's returned to this neonate. He's this tiny little creature in the belly mm -hmm. of, of the great mother. And sometimes when our egos are extraordinarily out of sync with our authentic nature, which is held by the self in this story by God, we may require an, a painful regression, going back to a kind of psychological infancy to then be reborn in a way that reflects much more fully who we authentically are. And here, it would be that Jonah has rejected the mission of his life needs to return to the womb and be reissued again, hopefully in alignment with the primary value that the self is instilling in him. Uh, so this is really a um, great example of regression in the service of growth, of a return to the unconscious and a uh, deeply introverted state that can also look like depression of this kind of surrender and that the ego is then relativized in recognizing something greater. It's not just Jonah doing what he, what he wants to do and such as go on a cruise instead of go to Nineveh, but there is a superordinate power uh, that has to guide his life. And this kind of darkness, loneliness, uh, and this kind of container, uh, the whale or the great fish, of, the, of this dark belly, womb-like place, uh, is often very much what it feels like. And his prayer is very much a description mm -hmm. of a paralyzing depression. From deep in the realm of the dead, I called for help. I mean, I have, all of us have either felt or heard our analysis Sands say something comparable that in, in the depths, depths, depths of a depression, that people feel like they are in the realm of the dead. Yeah. That the seas and the seaweed are wrapping around them and they are sinking down to the roots of the mountains. And he is praying f from within the belly. So he is in the, in the absolute grip of the depression. Mm -hmm. And he is demonstrating something that Jung advocated for, is when we are in the depths, which he himself experienced, it's developing the correct, what he would call religious attitude, but the correct attitude towards the self that then can save us. And I'd like to compare this to Jung's story in Memories, Dreams, and Reflections, when he is in the grip of this overwhelming, tumultuous sea of unconscious forces. He's having these visions. He's having overwhelming feelings. He writes in his memoir that he's got a pistol in his side table, and he says to the self, if you don't get me out of here, I will kill myself which is just what Jonah says, just let me die, just just shoot me. Such me. despair. And at that moment, dream, uh, Jung has the dream of the town square in the shape of a mandala, which is a manifestation of the self. And it's by turning to this absolute crushed, 
clarity that something greater than myself has to reach down and save me. That like the sailors who think they can just row in a panic to the shore, but it doesn't work. All of us, including Jung, trying everything that we've got our hands on to save us from our psychological fate and finding that we have to surrender and cry out to something greater than us to save us. Edward Edinger, who has a well-known Jungian scholar, author, analyst, says that all great problems of the psyche have to do with the relationship between the ego and the self. And uh, we see that really portrayed here in this uh, dream of Jonah, and that Jonah is experiencing one of the awful polarities of alienation. Mm. Uh, the other polarity that is also difficult is inflation, which in a way is where he began because he dared to defy the message that he knew to be true, uh, which is symbolized as going to Nineveh. Uh, so he goes from inflation and his ego uh, idea about avoiding the task to alienation uh, in the belly of the whale. But you know, Joseph, in my text, it says uh, that uh, the Lord spewed Jonah out on dry land. I was interested <laughs> that yours went right for calling it vomiting. <laughs> And there he is all of a sudden, and guess where? In Nineveh. Absolutely, all roads lead to Nineveh. <laughs> yes, that we can avoid our fate for but so long. And if we're lucky, the self will take us by the scruff and drag us to our fate. And depending on whether we're dragged there or whether we go willingly, often changes the story we tell ourselves. And Jonah was obviously dragged there. But this time, he does accede to his task. And it turns out that Nineveh is a big city. It takes him three days, another three-day image here, to walk through the whole city. Um, and he warns everybody that if you know you don't shape up, um, you got 40 days, and then uh, it'll be over for you. And that there is something here about Jonah's conviction, uh, the truth of what he is saying, that causes everybody in Nineveh and even the king uh, to repent. They mourn, they put on sackcloth, etc. So psychologically... How do we see this encounter between Jonah and the people of Nineveh? The encounter with his shadow is fruitful. Ego approaching shadow allows an encounter, a meeting, and an integration of to consciousness. The people of Nineveh become more conscious. And, and it occurs to me that had Jonah not gone through that incredible encounter with regression and shadow and suffering, that he might not have had the authority that he carried into Nineveh. That for all of us, suffering deepens something in the soul. It allows us to carry more it allows us to speak with a kind of gravity and authority that those who have not suffered often do not have. And it gives the voice of, of our Jonah voice, we might call it, a kind of gravitas uh, that is recognized in this uh, dream by the people of Nineveh. And I'm thinking in the consulting room or in life of, of that recognition that's right, there is truth here that comes from the suffering. And then it is not that hard to give up uh, some of the uh, wicked ways that the people of Nineveh have been living. 
uh, because the ego and the self and the in more integrated conscious personality is now bigger than all these relatively minor inequities. Something else that I find really interesting in the decree of the king is that he demands these austerities, no, no food, no water, and be put in sackcloth. And then he says that both the people and the animals have to participate in this austerity. And that's very interesting to me that, that the correction, this submission to the self and this submission to conscious suffering is happening on multiple levels of the psyche, all the way from the king that often represents the guiding attitude of the psyche, down to the body, down to the instincts, down to the animal that is also part of us, and that the only hope for this correction of relationship to the divine is for every level of the psyche to co-participate in this repentance and embracing of maturational suffering. And it works. It's uh, such a great image of, of a kind of unification of all those levels of the psyche, as you just said, conscious, unconscious, and instincts. Uh, an image of real connection and, and a kind of wholeness. And then what happens? Well, God changed his mind. He saw what they did. He said he would not bring upon all these calamities, uh, and he didn't do it. He spared the people of Nineveh. And we see this in the analytic room as well, that often when the unconscious is demanding something from the ego, if the ego resists too mightily, then the unconscious begins to constellate illness in the body, conflict in relationships, and in that synchronistic way, can also create very strange, calamitous events around us. And when we can figure out what the unconscious wants from us and engage it, there is this relief and release that happens, not just in the inner environment, but in the outer environment as well. And just as God says in the story of Jonah, that because they turned from their evil ways, or they turned away from the path that the self has not sanctioned, there's no longer this need to increase the level of suffering in order to reform the ego or the ego's attitude that this was enough of a correction to release the tension. I think what happens next in this dream really reminds me of, uh, you know, those dreams where you think, oh, good, you know, there's the ending, uh, this is the lysis, everything is okay, but then there's this little sort of break, and then there's like, whoops, what, what happened next? Because now Jonah is uh, angry again. He objects to God for giving the people of, of Nineveh. He says, wait a minute, you know, isn't this what I said while I was still in my own country? This is why I fled to Tarshish at the beginning. <laughs> he finds it difficult to accept that God can be gracious and merciful, slow to anger, abounding in steadfast love and ready to relent from punishing. He wanted uh, the people of Nineveh to be punished. Once again, we see that the ego position, the dream ego, if we continue our analogy to this as a dream, uh, has a very difficult time accepting uh, something foreign to it, which is the forgiveness, the graciousness. And that even though the dream ego has... Uh, acceded to change its behavior. Yes, he went to Nineveh. Yes, he prophesied as he walked <laughs> for three days to the city. But actually, secretly, 
he hadn't really changed his attitude. <laughs> like he was holding on to this kind of resentment, this mm -hmm. angry resentment and this kind of sadistic fantasy that, you know, these people are really going to get it. Yeah. And I'm going to enjoy that. Don't all of us, from an ego standpoint, have our ideas about what's fair? <laughs> this kind of thing doesn't seem fair. The people of Nineveh have been wicked and sinful, and they should be punished. Uh, so it, it comes from a very different place, uh, that instead of punishment, they've been spared. And the dream ego cannot wrap his mind around it. And so here's a very, another I instance of where ego and unconscious are out of alignment. And the ego is struggling to internalize uh, this kind of uh, forgiveness to the people of Nineveh. The redemption doesn't seem possible. And Jonah doesn't really extend that redemption to himself either. It's as if he doesn't believe in redemption as a concept. Because again, he says, take my life away. It's better for me to die than to live. Is somebody going to put me out of my misery? Throw me in the ocean. You know, God strike me dead. So he's still in this kind of very primal black and white kind of thinking, which he also wants to apply to the city of Nineveh. You're either right or you're wrong. And if you're wrong, <laughs> you know, there's only one solution, which is to get thrown in the ocean, eaten by a fish to, to be punished severely, which makes me think about this old analytic aphorism that the face we turn to the unconscious is the face that looks back at us. So one of the things that we don't hear in the beginning of the story is that Joan is a really angry, slightly sadistic psyche. And, you know, he's walking around with that. And when he comes into the great ocean of the unconscious, as he's sailing to on his cruise to Tarshish, the unconscious begins to show him the face that he has, which is violent and tumultuous and life-threatening and punishing that that is a mirror for who Jonah is at the beginning of that story. He's a, he's a pretty severe, punishing fella. So there's another lesson here, that after this uh, plea to God, objecting to God's decision about Nineveh, uh, God comes back to Jonah one more time, and says, okay, he makes a bush or in some versions a vine uh, that grows overnight to shade Jonah, who's hiding out at the edge of the city in the scorching sun. And it grows up in a day, and then it dies overnight. And God says, uh, wait a minute, you, you didn't grow this bush, and neither did you make it grow die. So if you didn't do this for one little bush, shouldn't I be concerned about Nineveh? When there are so many people, 120,000 people and their animals, why don't you let me worry about this <laughs> in effect and, and let go of your very concrete, rigid, uh, moralistic code and uh, your... Uh, sort of egocentricity about thinking that you know better than than me. And again, just as you said, Deb, that the self had to come back and bake him <laughs> in the heat of the desert until he's ready to faint. That the ego once again has to be brought to its knees in order for the self to define the attitude. And here the attitude is this surrender to the larger arc of the collective unconscious, and also to let go of, as you had said earlier, Deb, this inflation that Jonah knows better than God what should happen to the Ninevites. He's, he's arguing with God the way like a toddler would argue with their parents, and particularly arguing about who should get in trouble in the family. 
<laughs> well, you just sent me to my room for this problem, saying you're not, you know, the rest of the kids were also involved in this problem, and you're not doing anything to them. And God, you know, I can just imagine God rolling his eyes. Yes. And isn't that so much the human story? Uh, we err. We don't see things. We're blind. We're egotistical. We're a hundred thousand things. And then we learn a lesson. And then we do it all over again. Uh, so that uh, the psyche continues to have lesson after lesson. And we we grow and we grow. And I'm also thinking that how difficult it is to to face the shadow of going to Nineveh, whatever our particular Nineveh might be, and seeing that they are us. But it's also just as difficult uh, to really incorporate a larger kind of love and to accept that, to accept something bigger uh, more spacious than our uh, rigid legal or legalistic codes. And this softening to include empathy, this softening to include the possibility of transformation, is a theme that moves through the entire collective mythos of the Old and the New Testament. This cycle of birth, death, and resurrection, which is foreshadowed in some ways in the story of Jonah, that he's born in a certain state, he returns to the great ocean and the great belly, where psychologically he dies, and then he is resurrected and re-educated to have a different kind of attitude about himself, about other people, about the world. And it foreshadows the story of Jesus, which happens in the Gospels. Jesus is resurrected and becomes an aspect of the divine, which Jonah doesn't achieve. But it's hinting at something. It's hinting at the three days in the tomb. It's also hinting at the 40 days in the desert, that the Israelites have to go through 40 years, excuse me, in the desert, as well as Christ's experience being tempted in the desert, that all of these themes keep ringing through the collective psyche, which are then captured in myths and sacred texts, because there is some truth about it. And that the interaction of, of Jonah and the Lord, Yahweh, uh, is very much, I think, like the, the interaction of our egos with our own shadows and with the self. Jonah is in a very different relationship with the self uh, at the end of this story then, or this dream than he was at the beginning. Whereas at the beginning, he avoided and evaded. Uh, at the end, the self is much closer. They are in dialogue. Uh, ego may not really kind of get it all completely, um, but there is a receptivity and a back and forth exchange. And the relationship is, is very different in feeling uh, than it was at the beginning. And so shall it be for all of us. Uh, we would very much hope from a Jungian point of view. And so perhaps this is a good time to transition into a dream. Hey, Lisa, what's been going on about your book? Well, it was released on May 25th, and sales have been strong. And I've been receiving so many lovely emails and texts and phone calls from from friends and from uh, people that I don't know telling me how much they've enjoyed the book. And so that feels really great. The reviews on Amazon have all been glowing and that's been really heartening. It's just really wonderful to know that this project of mine is resonating with so many people. I'm just uh, so happy for you and it's such a lovely, lovely book both deep and accessible 
about the inner journey around being a mother. It's never been, that's never been written about. It hasn't been out there. And that it's getting such an enthusiastic, heartfelt reception. That's wonderful. Yeah. I would love it if listeners who've read the book could write a review on Amazon because <laughs> although there are many wonderful ones there, um, more is always better. So thanks in advance for that. You've really incarnated something that was in the ethers that needed to be pulled down, needed to be shaped in words, and needed to be made accessible. And the proof in the pudding is that it's beginning to have a kind of life of its own in the collective. <laughs> yes. That speaks a lot to the timeliness of this. Yeah, I think you're right, Tessa. The, the analogy to a baby is just too rich and too good and too multifaceted to be <laughs> missed. <laughs> it's having a life of its own, which yeah. is just what we want. Our dreamer is a 32-year-old male who works as a research engineer. And here's his dream. I'm at my girlfriend's apartment standing in a hallway with several doors. All of them, save one, are closed. Behind them, I sense a tremendous power. I stop in front of one of the closed doors and open it, but I don't cross the threshold. It's either my girlfriend's childhood room or it's mine. I guess that I first believe it to be hers, but then understand that it's mine. The room looks quite innocent, but I sense a trap inside. I somehow understand that I may ask one question to the presence that lingers in the room, and that the question will be answered. I also understand that if I enter the room and the force is benign, I may exit and come back as I please, but if the presence is not benign, I will never be able to leave once I enter. So I need to construct a question that operates on two levels at the same time. It must seem to be an innocent question, but with a hidden purpose to determine the nature of the force. I start to think, but draw a blank. Then a question very clearly drops down into my mind, and I examine it. It's not only a good question, it's the perfect question I put it forth. How can one know when it is enough? The answer comes quickly, accompanied by the sound of gnashing teeth and crushing boulders, and all too clearly revealed the nature of this entity. It can never be enough. I then understand that it is the devil who addresses his frustrated angst in these words, and the answer makes me completely uninterested in entering the room. I decide instead to continue. I'm done with the things that are here, so I go to the room with the open door, and after a short period of preparation I fly away. When I fly through the window, a strange things happen. As I pass through the glass, I feel that my amber body is being cleansed. It's as if all the impurities that have accumulated during the entire ordeal were stopped from passing through, as if the glass was some kind of a filter. As a result, I feel more free as I continue my journey. As context he offers, I had broken off contact with my parents some two years before. I deem my father to be an evil man. The main feelings in the dream are pressure, obligation, but not so much fear. So this is another kind of religious encounter. Yes. This is another uh, real sort of teaching tale, uh, story dream. So if we start at the beginning, he's at an apartment, his girlfriend's apartment, the Animas area of the psyche. And there's a hallway, which is kind of a transitional space. And through the hallway, you can traverse to various other environments. And there are doors which suggest options. But all of them, except for one, is closed. So we have this interesting situation where there's obviously an invitation to walk through the open door. 
But there's all these other options that he has that kind of haunt him a little bit. You know, is the open door the easy, unobstructed path the way I should go? Or should I force myself, you know, into some of these locked or closed doors? He has volition is important at the beginning of the dream. It's interesting that um, he understands the room to be his own room. Uh, he says, I understand it is, it, it's mine. It looks innocent, but I sense there is a trap inside. So now he's in the realm of his childhood complex. He's back in time uh, to something that looks innocent, but feels dangerous. And of course, I'm wondering, as as we might if we had him here, uh, given that he senses his father to be a, an evil man, of tell me more about your childhood, meaning the kind of complex that it has arisen in you. Now, one of the things that I'm wondering is, well, first of all, he does go to one of the closed doors and opens it rather than going to the one that was already offered to him. And he says that the room looks quite innocent, but I sense a trap inside. And I think about the way an innocence complex is kind of a trap that particularly in a religious context, innocence can be overvalued. Mm -hmm. There's a sense of purity and spirituality and a kind of divine child energy. But for an adult man, that's a trap because the world is not kind to adults who walk around like innocent children. We also have a little bit of a, a parallel, uh, and maybe I'm still back on Jonah, but uh, the dream ego uh, has gone into this thing about translating his dilemma into thought. And don't we all do that? We go upstairs to make meaning to, he's got to go through this sort of problem that is framed as if it is a cognitive problem, that he has to figure out exactly the right question to figure out the nature of this force. I start to think, but I draw a blank. So he goes into his ego complex uh, when he's under uh, stress and perplexed uh, in this dream. And he's a research engineer, so this is like <laughs> an easy place to go, all of if, this kind of thinking analysis, which is probably very successful for him in the waking world. Exactly. And so many people do this. We turn, just like Jonah, we turn to our, our versions of morality and justice, uh, to constructs, to thought constructs, to uh, solve a feelingful problem, a problem in an encounter with the unconscious, a problem in an encounter with one of our own complexes, uh, as if we could think our way through these things. But then a question drops down into my mind. So the question comes from some other part of the psyche, not the dream ego. How can one know when it is enough? And then the answer is it can never, in big capital letters, be enough. So we know at that point we're somewhere in the world of instincts, but also we're in the world of kind of distorted instinct. Because if our instincts are healthy, then they also tend to self-regulate. And by that I mean, we have an instinct around hunger. When I'm hungry, I eat. And if the instinct is healthy enough, we eat, and then we're sated, and then we're done. But this is, this is a giant maw, a giant churning mouth that is saying, it's never enough. You can never feed me enough. So I am thinking of this uh, drama, this story, the narrative, as part one was about the the rooms and the innocence, as you've said, Joseph. 
part two is this dropping down into something really primal. It's never enough. The sound of gnashing teeth and crushing boulders. It's the devil who dresses, dresses his frustrated angst in these words. And then it makes the dream ego entirely avoidant of entering the room. And is that a missed opportunity? Well, what he does is part three of this little drama, uh, and he flies away. I fl he flies through the window, passes through glass. He has an amber body that's being cleansed and feels more free as he continues on his journey. And I am thinking that this kind of flying away uh, may be, it's depicted in this dream, as what happens when confronted uh, with this kind of an awful problem, of something that can't really be solved intellectually to form the perfect question, being thrown into this uh, primal pit of uh, deviltry and gnashing teeth, and then what happens is fly away. Right, the hero left the battle. Or I'm thinking of it along the lines of a possible spiritual bypass yeah. that we just elevate up above and avoid either one of these choices, which is sort of like the choice between Scylla and Charybdis in the Odyssey of you can get eaten by the horrible whirlpool with its gnashing teeth or with by the hydra-headed monster. We can put this into a historic context. He doesn't speak to his parents, and he thinks his father is an evil man, and then the devil comes up and says it's never enough, which is something that people sometimes carry away from childhood, which is, you're never enough. What you do is never enough. You're never good enough. You never got the right grade. You're not doing it the way the parental system you know, demands, or at least the individual feels that way. And to me, again, using a heroic lens, this is this actually is a time to go into that room to face the devil that says you're never enough, nothing is enough, and to battle with that part of yourself which is still alive. And saying that to you somewhere in one of these rooms, the good news is that the dream has given you a kind of symbolic frame to both imagine and engage the it's never enough complex inside of you. So ostensibly you might be able to return to that and actually fight the battle with that part of yourself, part of the parental complexes. But here, just as you said, Deb, in order to avoid the battle, he becomes a kind of ephemeral spirit that can fly and pass through glass and and the thing that I think is siphoned off or cleansed is the physical, because a body can't pass through glass. So the mind passes through the glass, and the body kind of falls away as a kind of impurity, which is very Gnostic, by the way. <laughs> but it's problematic in terms of having a life that's successful, where we can carry a kind of embodied authority. So I think that there is a bit of a missed opportunity that night for the dreamer. I think that this opportunity is going to present itself many times. He's a young man. So this is just the beginning of, I think, a kind of midlife crisis. It's like a foreshadowing of a certain devilish issue in the psyche that is not going anywhere and is going to require a real confrontation. You've been listening to This Jungian Life. From our website, thisjungianlife.com, you can follow us on Twitter, like us on Facebook, help us produce future episodes by funding us through Patreon, and submit your dreams for possible interpretation on another episode. We'd like to thank our listener who shared a dream for today's show and hope you'll let us know what topics you'd enjoy hearing more about. 
Until next time, keep living this Jungian life.